Okay. Um, my screen came up and said you have to upload to NERS software, which I did. I thought I did, and now um, it just took me offline again. Sorry for that. I would say, well, I'm even going to wait for all of you to get back online. I, I would say for us who are practicing Krishna consciousness, we have to be conscious or aware that we're getting enough Krishna consciousness. We're, it's like eating enough. Are you eating enough? Are you eating the right food? How do you feel? Do you feel strong? We have to be giving ourselves enough Krishna consciousness because if we don't, the naturally as conditioned souls, we, we hanker after pleasure and we're going to want to find it somewhere. And Prabhupada wanted us to find pleasure in Krishna consciousness. Now, in Krishna consciousness, we have music, we have art, we have drama, we have food, we have dance, we have literature. We have so many things that you could saturate yourself completely with. You could saturate all your senses with spiritual uh, food. And that's what, that's what happens the more you advance, the more you absorb yourself in talking about Krishna, discussing the philosophy, hearing. So those are the things you need to be doing, discussing philosophy and not um, meditating also on sense gratification. I'm so happy I don't have sense gratification. Um, because we're always meditating on sense gratification. It kind of nullifies all the Krishna consciousness. It's just like it drains it out. So the thing is, there's so many ways you can be Krishna conscious. There's so many ways to be absorbed. So many things you can do. Prabhupada's service is um, it's the greatest gift. It's the greatest satisfaction we could have, isn't it? So you have to be absorbed to it. You know, it's like, let's say, okay, let's say it's really hot. Like really, really hot, like it's 40 degrees, right? So you all decide, okay, we're going to go. What if you have an ocean or a lake or a river? We're going to go in the water, right? And, and I say, you know, if you go in the water, even if it's this hot, it'll cool you off, right? So we get there and I dive in the water and I say, oh, I feel so much better. It's so much cooler. Then I get out of the water, the wind's blowing. So even if it's a hundred degree wind, but still because I'm wet, it actually cools me off. I have this experience in my approach because it gets very hot there. In the summer, and we go bathe in the Ganga, and we get out. It was actually cool. And then we drive back on our motor scooter. We're all wet, and it cools us off. So, so let's say I dive in, and then you go into your knees. For some reason, you you you're reluctant, or you can't go in, and then you're sitting there, the water up to your knees, and going, and you're telling me, you said, you know, you said that I would cool off, but I'm just as hot. And I said, well, you're not actually in the water completely. You're only up to your knees. And then you're saying, this doesn't work. I'm going, I have to go inside where it's air conditioned. I, I'm not cooling off. So, you know, if you're going up to your knees or ankles or even your waist in Krishna consciousness, it's not going to cool you off. You have to actually dive in. And there, there's so many ways to dive in. Then if you dive in, you'll cool off and then you won't hanker after the material. But if you're like kind of half in, then you're leaving yourself half, half open for everything else. So, um, uh, if I experience a spiritual high, a pleasure, attachment, like a wonderful Sunday feast, ecstatic kirtan, rock yatra, how to deal if I feel unhappy when we don't do those spiritual activities? That gave... Uh, spiritual activities that gave me happiness, like, for example, daily affairs, job, family, etc., which, of course, should also be in the spiritual mood. That's a good question. Um, when you're at your job, you can think, let's do another Ratyatra. That was so ecstatic. How can we organize one? That's okay. You know, there's a funny story. There was a devotee who lived in Dallas, Texas, and... Um, she was living maybe 20, 30 miles from the temple, like a half hour drive. There was a temple community. And there were maybe like 10, 15 houses 
within a block of the temple where devotees were living in, and she couldn't get a house, or for some reason she wasn't able to live close. And she wrote her spiritual master, and her spiritual master said something kind of interesting, which answers, in a way, answers your question. He said, sometimes when you live near the temple, you take it for granted, and you take the devotees for granted. And sometimes, sometimes people who um, live live near the temple, they don't actually go to the temple all the time. He said, but if you live far away, you'll always be thinking of the temple, and you'll always be thinking of the devotees, and, and thinking how to get there. Isn't that interesting? So in a sense, the answer to your question is, and it's not bad that you're thinking, oh, that rock is so good. I don't like the work I'm doing. I want to do that rock yatra. Because your mind is on Krishna thinking how you can get more Krishna consciousness. And sometimes devotees don't realize it, that engaging in their daily activities is actually helping them by creating a separation. They're actually thinking more of Krishna than even sometimes devotees in the temple would be thinking. Isn't that interesting? I don't know if you realize that, but it, it's true for... Sometimes, you know, when you're not doing something Krishna conscious directly to maintain your family, it's actually helping you, although you think it's hurting you, because it's creating a hankering, which you may not have if you lived in a temple or you were engaged full time. Um, that, um, yeah. So sometimes it's actually helping you and you don't realize it, because in your question, what I see is there's a hankering to be, to have the ecstasy of Rathyantra, or for some who've lived in India, or the, to go back to the Dham, or whatever it is. So, you know, many of you like have, have gone home and, and uh, are living in the Dham and had to go back home, take care of your parents, or make money, or whatever, and you're thinking of the Dham, and you're thinking when you can be there, and you're hankering for it, and it actually is detaching you, because... You're looking at your material situation and you're thinking, this is like, uh, this is like, you know, this is not good, but it actually becomes good. So I think if you, if you meditate on it, you'll find that a lot, a lot of times, in, unless you're very Krishna conscious, that having to work in the world and do these things, it's actually helping you. Because like for some people say, well, I don't, you know, I'm working and I have to do all these other things. Well, then the question is, could you be completely renounced? And could you live without working and live as a full-time devotee? And live very simply, you might say, well, no, I can't do that. And so, okay, then you have to work. So, because you have to do it, um, it's actually purifying you. And someday, you're going to come to the point and say, I don't want to do this anymore. I just want to do full-time devotional service. And you'll be able to retire and you'll be able to do it because of all that hankering and all the experience of working in the world that was giving you kind of what you wanted and needed, but at the same time leaving you a little bit empty. So it works that way. You know? So sometimes you can see it, you know, oh, I have to do this, it's not Krishna conscious. But sometimes you could see this actually helping you become Krishna conscious. Believe it or not. So another question. In the same way you say we should act as if we're humble to be humble. These statements are just popping up on top of other statements. Um, can we act as if we were happy, even if for some reason at the beginning we do not feel happy when chanting? Yeah, but um, you can, and you can remind yourself. You said this is this is actually my eternal position. Remind yourself of that, and. Um, like I have the mantra, I love to chant, I get to chant, I want to chant, I want to chant, I get to chant, I want to chant, I love to chant. So it's, it's creating an affirmation of what's real. When I'm not happy chanting, that's not real. I mean, it seems real, but ultimately, spiritually, it's not real. What's real is ecstasy and Krishna consciousness. So I love to chant, I want to chant. Yeah, so you kind of reframe yourself. I actually, okay, I have to chant now. I'm feeling like I don't want to chant, but actually, 
I do want to chant as a servant of Krishna, as a soul. I love to chant. I want to chant. So we have to think of it that way. And um, my wife was mentioning yesterday that sometimes if you change your physiology and go, yes, I love to chant. You know, because if you go into, let's say, chanting, you don't want to do it. Your physiology kind of goes down, your consciousness, everything's going down. So stand up, jump up and say, I'd love to chant, I want to chant. Yes, go around that and turn around it. Yes, jump up. So, you know, okay, that's artificial, but at the same time, it's actually true. Um, I, I just heard this other speaker saying that dancing, just, just from the material perspective, dancing can make people very happy by releasing certain hormones. You know, when you move your body that way, you naturally feel better. So, yes, Prabhupada once said, if you don't feel like da dancing in the kirtan, dance anyway. And then by dancing, you'll want to dance. So that's how it works. So, you know, you don't feel like chanting. You're just shuffling your feet in the kirtan. Just force yourself to dance. Get up and dance. Because even from a psychological and physiological interconnection, dancing will uplift your spirits. So, yeah, sometimes you just have to do it even though you don't feel like it because it's going to make you feel like it. And don't forget, Alejandro, you love to chant. You really do love to chant. I tell yourself you do. Okay. I am not sure which way up. I'm going up or down. Hmm. Okay. All right. Let's, um, class is ready to end and we didn't even read something the prophet said. Um, I feel that worrying about money or having to acquire money is a big obstacle. Yes. I wish I didn't have to worry about this. Yes. It would free me to serve. Yes. Then again, it just goes to the mind making something up. I'm not sure the last statement. Well, see, the thing is, you just have to deal with your reality. Um, I mean, you're a single man. You could get on a plane right now and live in Mayapur for like 250 euros a month. That means about 3,000 euros a year. So you could do that. Then you wouldn't have to make money. And being in Mayapur and you're trying to be a coach, you could develop your coaching and then um, you'd only need about three coaching clients a month to support yourself. So you could do that. So um, but you have needs and maybe you can't do that. Maybe you need to live in the West and have a certain standard of living. And therefore, if that's the case, then you have to accept that you'll need to work, you'll need to make money on, on a level where you're going to need a few thousand, maybe like 3,000 euros not 300 euros, which you could live on in in India. So, you know, we have to deal with the realities of our own desires and needs. And so if that's our desire and need, that's what it is. And um, you understand? So, um, um, oh yeah, and, and they say having to make money is a big obstacle to Christian consciousness. Well, Prabhupada said nothing, uh, nothing that we're doing, if it's not sinful or not against the principles of bhakti, is an obstacle. So nothing, nothing that we need to do to maintain our material existence becomes an obstacle unless it's it's um, unless it's taking away. Excuse me, it's still early here. Unless it's taking away from our devotional service, you know, if I if I have to work fifteen hours a day, just so I can eat a few pieces of toast, that's probably going to interfere with my bhakti. But if it's just if I have to work a normal job to pay my bills, Prabhupada said that nothing like that can impede your bhakti. The problem is we allow it to impede our bhakti because of our immaturity. Or some devotees, um, they had to go home and take care of their parents. This is another situation. Can't, does that impede your bhakti? Well, 
It depends on the environment, but it depends on you and how you deal with the environment. And so Prabhupada wanted us to mature to a level where we could be Krishna conscious in various situations. Right? He didn't want us to have to, um, you know, be in a situation where we couldn't be Krishna conscious. Oh, I can't be Krishna conscious. There are situations which are toxic, overcome by the mode of ignorance. You know, if you have a bunch of friends who are all alcoholics, yeah, you wouldn't want to associate with them. That, that's an obvious situation in which you can't be Christian conscious. But normal situations where we have to work in the world, obviously if, if we can't be Krishna conscious in those situations and we have to do them, then why become a devotee? You just, you know, hang up your bee bag and say, it's not possible, it can't be done. Now, granted, it's difficult. I won't say it's not difficult. And ideally, we should be living all together in communities, working together in businesses we create. That would make it much easier. And so, if you have this feeling, any of you have this feeling that I'd rather not be working, I'd rather be more fully engaged in devotional service, then put your thinking caps on how you, together with other devotees in your community, can develop programs or businesses ideally, which are directly Krishna conscious, if it's possible, in which we can all be working together and, and earning income in devotee association. That would be fantastic. Wouldn't it? And I think that's the... Um, that, to me, I think that has to happen because the dilemma that you're all experiencing, it's a real dilemma and it takes... A mature Krishna consciousness to deal with it and it's something you know we have to deal with it but I think the problem today is that um, you know the association that we're we're working with in the businesses we have may always not may not always be that good and the consciousness of people many people it's going down people are becoming more selfish more sensual and they don't even know it of course, consciousness of some people is going up. Consciousness in the world on one hand is going up, on the other hand it's going down. And so to, to be associated in certain toxic environments, obviously it's a challenge. And in some cases, we probably shouldn't work certain jobs because we may, may not be mature enough to deal with them. So, you know, you have both sides. And, and I would say that if we don't like a situation, let us imagine a better situation and let us think, well, how could we develop that? How could we develop a better situation? How could we create companies in which we could all be preaching? Let me read something that Prabhupada said. Um, this is from Second Canto, 6th chapter, text 46. Um, um, well, no, I think we read that one. This is from 4.8.28. My dear Dhruva, if you feel that your sense of honor has been insulted, you still have no cause for dissatisfaction. This kind of dissatisfaction is another feature of the illusory energy. Every living entity is controlled by his previous actions, and therefore there are different varieties of life for enjoying or suffering. And uh, what's being said here is accept your suffering, or accept your situation karmically, um, and that way you won't be dissatisfied. So, of course, this is a topic for next week, but one of the reasons people are dissatisfied is they can't accept their karmic situation. It's just they don't like it. Things are happening, they don't like it, and it's very difficult to accept something that makes you uneasy or makes you unhappy. Or So then, then you're dissatisfied with your life, but your life is a karmic result of what you created, but you're dissatisfied with your own creation. So, so many people are not living even a sattvic life. So their, their lives are in passion. And obviously, if you live in passion, you're going to be dissatisfied with the results that passion produce. So that's why there's so much dissatisfaction, because as Krishna says in the Gita, the result of passion is always poisonous in the end. So, you know, I have a karmic situation, and I'm trying to prove it through sense gratification. And that just makes it worse. And that's the problem. Okay, if you have bad karma, you have to tolerate that. You have to create good karma. But increasing eating, sleeping, mating, defending is not going to create good karma. 
And so as a consequence, you just create more bad karma. And so as a consequence, the more you engage in material activities, the more you become dissatisfied because you're creating this bad karma and you're doing things which can't satisfy you spiritually, which we talked about last week, this, this statement, we have a fundamental quarrel with reality, right? Reality is one way, we as spirit soul are a different way, and it's oil and water. Reality is temporary, we're eternal. We as eternal beings, it's like we don't function well in a temporary environment. We don't function well in an environment which is predominated by the material modes of nature where there's misery and suffering because our nature is ananda. And we don't do well in an environment which is overcome by ignorance because we're chit. We're, we're conscious. We're full of knowledge. So people are trying to solve their problems by engaging in passion and ignorance. And it's always going to leave them empty because it doesn't touch them spiritually. So Sundari Radha wanted me to talk uh, in these classes about dissatisfaction. And I think the obvious dissatisfaction is that your spirit soul and you're neglecting, completely neglecting your spiritual life and thinking that you'll solve all your problems through sense gratification. Look, if you get a good job, you get more money, what do you get? You get more sense gratification, and that's supposed to solve your problems, right? More sense gratification does not solve your problems. If, you know, if you don't have enough food, okay. If you don't have shelter, you don't have clothing, you don't have heat, like that, yeah. But once you have those necessities, more sense gratification doesn't solve your problems. Because your problem of not being happy will never be solved by sense gratification. It will only be solved by something spiritual. So until you come to that level, all it's doing is it's, it's amplifying your problem. It's amplifying this duality between you needing eternity, knowledge, and bliss, and your effort in this world by which you get none of that. And there's this gap, and in that gap of what you try to get and what you actually get, is that's where the dissatisfaction lies. And everyone experiences it. And nobody cannot not experience this on some level. Everybody lives with this. And I, I think people don't even realize the level of dissatisfaction they're living with because they're so used to it. It's so normal. There's always this gap in their life between sensual pleasure and satisfaction. I'll lift my hands up. Sensual pleasure and satisfaction. There's always this gap here, and they live with it every day, and they're so used to it that they're not even aware of it. That, so, so for a lot of people, it's gratification, pleasure, let down, gratification, pleasure, let down, dissatisfaction, gratification, pleasure, let down. That's just how their life is. That's what they believe it is. They don't, they don't understand <clears throat> it can be any other way. And uh, when I was younger, distributing books, and I would tell people, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm always happy, they would say, you can't always be happy. It's not their experience. They, they they think, no, you're lying to me. Or they make up some stupid remark like, oh, that'd be boring. It's just like a defense mechanism. It wouldn't be boring. Or maybe the way you make yourself happy would be, would be boring. But spiritually, it's not boring. Oh, yeah. Maybe your happiness is boring. So you think if you're always happy, you'd be bored. Okay, I could agree with that. It would be boring for you. But if it's spiritual, it wouldn't be boring. So they don't have experience of that. So they just think normal life is, normal life is, you know, up, down, up, down, up, down. Happy, down, dissatisfied. Happy, down, dissatisfied. Happy, down. Okay, that was great. I rode a 50-foot wave. But now I'm dissatisfied because I want a 60-foot wave. That was great. I had a, a shot of vodka. Now I need two shots. So dissatisfaction is built in to sense gratification, it has to be. And therefore, you always want more. Because you go up and you go down, and that's you come back to this dissatisfied level. Krishna consciousness, the idea is you can chant Hare Krishna and be satisfied right here, right now. Okay, we have two more questions. Nick is saying, if you don't befriend your confusion on the one hand, old ways of being ready to die, on the other hand, new ways of being eager to be born. The bridge is confusion. We must learn how to cross it. It on the way home. Jeff Brown. Okay, let's read Bhakti Jeff. 
You don't befriend your confusion. On the one hand, old ways of being ready to die. On the other, new ways of being eager to be born. The bridge is confusion. We must learn how to cross it. Well, that's why we became devotees. It was that confusion and that um, unhappiness that was pulling us. So, um, what he's saying is basically you have to you have to accept it and face it. And a lot of people, you know, it's hard for a lot of people to say, "My life doesn't work. I'm unhappy." It's at that point you can be open to spiritual life. But before you know, I'm happy. Everything's good. You don't want to admit defeat. You know, you're you're doing so many things to make yourself happy. It's hard for many people to say, "I'm not happy." No, I'm happy. Everything's good. You know, because that would be like saying, "I'm I'm a fool. I, I haven't figured it out." A lot of people aren't ready for that. But if you can admit it and say, okay, I'm not happy, I don't know why, there's confusion, and what's the solution? Then we show up and we give them the solution. But the important point for all of us is, is and I think you understand this, is that we have to live the solution. So if, if we're not living the solution, if we're not relishing Krishna consciousness, if it's not making us happy, it's going to be extremely difficult to convincingly convince anybody of it. In fact, if we're not experiencing it, why would we want to share Krishna consciousness? Because we think, I took to Krishna consciousness, I gave up sense gratification, right now I'm not enjoying. I don't want you to go through the same suffering I'm going through. Actually, I'm going through hell right now. I don't want you to go through this hell. I'm not going to tell you to be Krishna conscious. You're doing okay now. You got a good job. You like what you're doing. You got a nice wife, family. I'm not going to rock your boat. You're okay. We could actually think that way if we're not happy in Krishna consciousness. And I'm sure some of you may have had that experience. On some level, feeling like, do I really want to give this person something that's not really satisfying me? So that's that's a huge concern. That and that's why it's so important for us to be Krishna conscious. So, we have another comment or question. Could we say that if we are in karmic a karmic situation, we don't accept, that situation actually holds our opportunities that we lack to see due to not accepting the situation? Yes. There might be Krishna, Krishna's gifts in that situation. Yeah. I think there's Krishna's gifts in every situation. And the... I think the main criteria is that a karmic situation, um, we want to look at it, we want to see Krishna's gifts, we want to see what Krishna is teaching us, we want to use it to advance in Krishna consciousness. That's the idea. Now, there may be some karmic situations which we, we, we try all of these things and the result is we can't be Krishna conscious in that situation. If that's the result, we have to act differently. We have to remove ourselves from it. But in most cases, that won't be uh, the case. That in most cases, we'll see that it's just Krishna pushing me in a certain direction where I need to go, where maybe I've been resistant to go in that direction, and now he's pushing me. And in order to accept this situation, I have to change how I see it, I have to change who I am, I have to change my consciousness. And so that's all good for me, and then I grow that way. So that's why I, I was saying, like in the job situation, that sometimes it's good because you learn how to exist in that situation and be Krishna conscious, and that's a, a great, a great achievement. And so the first thing is always to ask, well, how could I be Krishna conscious in this situation? Yeah, so we want to ask that first, right? How can I be Krishna conscious in this situation? We ask that. And we do everything we can to be Krishna conscious. Then if we can't, we may have to take other measures. But the first thing is, how can I be Krishna conscious? Krishna, what you want me to learn? And, and so that we make every effort possible and we discuss with other devotees, can you help me understand how to be Krishna conscious in this situation? We make every effort possible. And then, if we can't do it, we might realize, okay, this situation is... It's not conducive to bhakti. There's no way. There's nothing about this situation that can be transformed. And by staying in this situation, I'm degrading my Krishna consciousness. If that's the last straw, then yes, um, then we have to take that that action. But the first action is always, what's the lesson? What? How can I make this 
uh, a Krishna, I kind of turn this into a Krishna conscious impetus or realization or um, make it a more of a Krishna conscious situation for myself. And you'll find in many cases you can do that when, when you thought you couldn't. You'll find it more. Maybe it's an impetus just to chant better rounds, impetus to pray, impetus to learn. It could be many things. Now, there are some situations um, which devotees are in where there's really, that really the situation needs to be changed. They have no association. They have a job in an industry which is antithetical to bhakti or um, in an industry in which they have to associate with people whose association is having a very bad effect on them. They have a job where they're working 15 hours a day. Um, they're in a relationship in which their husband or wife is um, is abusive either physically or emotionally and it, it's it become impossible to maintain sanity. Like situations like that, um, we may have to deal with on a practical level. Like these are toxic situations which no matter how I change my consciousness, it's not going to help because the environment is so strongly against Krishna consciousness that I can't stand up to it. So those, those are situations I think are more rare than what you might be referring to. It's just a situation where I think it's bad, but I just need to change the way I see it, the way I react to it, and learn from it, and grow from it. And so um, that's it's very good to be in those situations. Okay, so we're going to end class here. And um, tonight I'm giving class in Ireland. And we were at 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And I was thinking of maybe broadcasting it. We're going to, okay, we'll try. I'll broadcast it on Facebook. But for many of you, you'll be asleep. Um, yeah, well, it'll be three in the morning or something for me. No, it'll be good for, uh, maybe it'll be good for Australia. It'll be Australian morning or something. Anyway, um, we're going to broadcast in Australia now. It should be 9.30, right? And so we're going to do this class in four and a half. Yeah, it's going to be in the morning. It'll be like 10.30 in the morning, 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So if you in Australia want to see it, it'll be tomorrow for you, like 11, 7 Eastern Standard Time. So what I'm going to do is I'll have my iPad in which we're doing the Skype, and I'll have this. And um, you'll be able to hear, just, I'll, I'll repeat the questions they're asking because you may not always be able to hear. So we'll try that. Um, we'll see how that goes. Give it a try in Gurunishti, you can advertise that. And thank you all for attending. And we'll see you tonight if you're around. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Finish. Okay. We'll try this. I don't know if it's going to work. Skype. And Facebook on two different devices. And I just got a new tripod, so I actually have two tripods. So this is going to be interesting. And um, yeah, it's going to be really interesting. Okay, we'll see how it goes. Hare Krishna.